Great. Starting at 10.08 here on August 21st, 2021. Great to be here with everybody. Uh, Kelvin Chin here on our next session with you in our Meet the Author series. Generally a monthly series uh, where uh, I, it's a free series. Anybody can join. Um, it's this same Zoom link for those of you who are live with us on Zoom. Um, it's the same Zoom link I use for this, uh, these talks about my uh, topics from my book. This is my second book, Marcus Aurelius Updated. It's available on all the online booksellers out there worldwide. Um, so you can get it on Amazon, or if you don't like Amazon, you can get it on all kinds of other booksellers, Barnes and Noble. Uh, we have uh, some folks on with us here from South Africa, and I, I know they've got got it from booksellers in South Africa, uh, the UK, all over the world, uh, Asia, Australia, etc. So um, we're going to talk about spiritual insecurity today. Spiritual insecurity, the meaning of life and perfection. That's the title of our talk today. We're going to talk about all those concepts. And you may think, what do they have to do with each other, these three ideas? Spiritual insecurity, the meaning of life, and perfection. Well, they actually are related, and I'm going to show you how they are related to each other in our discussion today. Um, so as I was saying, just as an introduction for those who haven't seen these talks before, um, I post these on my YouTube, my YouTube channel, my public YouTube channel. There's over 100 videos there. Um, and uh, but those who want to join live and interact and ask questions and so forth uh, can just send me an email and I'll send out an email to you. Uh, go to my website, send me an email via my website contact page. Just go to kelvinchin.org or any of my four websites. That's an easy one to remember. Um, and send me a, a, an email saying, hey, I want to be added to your email list about this monthly meet the author series. So, and then I'll add you to the list, then you'll find out when the dates are, what's the next topic, that kind of thing. Um, we're not gonna be doing one in September. We're gonna be doing one in October because I'm traveling and speaking in September and I don't have any open dates uh, in September. So for those of you who may have seen a September date, it's now changed to October. Um, talk about spiritual insecurity to start with okay so um you know why as i said these three ideas they 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 do have a common thread amongst all the three ideas we're going to talk about where's the confusion clouded them for thousands of years those of you who don't know me uh my memories go back six thousand years and i've been teaching for <laughs> many thousands of those six thousands of years um let's just <laughs> leave it at that uh but so i've been thinking about these ideas for a long long time not just this lifetime but obviously very in depth this lifetime uh and we're going to talk about how we can use greater understanding about these three concepts in a very practical way to help us live life more fully in the present now because those of you who've taken any of my other classes, you know that it's all about living in the present for me. It doesn't matter if you have past life memories or you don't have past life memories, you can still fully develop your self-awareness and so forth. Uh, but if you do have past life memories, it's all about how do they inform us today? And so I'm drawing from all of this experience that I have to help all of you, whether you believe in past lives or not, doesn't matter. It's all about living in the present today. So um, let's talk about this idea of spiritual insecurity. So I use this phrase, spiritual insecurity. The key word there is insecurity, quite frankly, because we all have insecurities about something. I mean, nobody is perfect. Not me, not you, not anybody, okay? Not any guru out there, not any, those of you who are mediums or have contacts with mediums on the other side, angels, whatever, none of them are perfect. Okay, nobody, we're going to talk about that, this idea of perfection. But everybody has some levels of insecurity is my point. All right, that's the thing. 
So what about this idea of spiritual insecurity? So that's maybe a new concept for some people to kind of marry up those two ideas. Everybody knows they have some insecurities, but what about spiritual insecurity? Well, to me, when I look at everything, <clears throat> I can talk about things in terms of, oh, spiritual, more spiritual, less spiritual. We can talk about gradations of spirituality if you want. But to me, life is about living life. And, and, and spirituality to me is just really about how we live our lives. Now, yes, we can talk about things that, are, that may seem to be in our cultural lexicon, in our word usage, in other words, um, you know, more spiritually oriented. But really, basically, what does it all distill down to, as I said, is it really the basis is our low self-confidence. Everybody, we have insecurities about this and that, da, 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 da. but really, the more, the, the lower our self-confidence, the higher our need for external confirmation that we're okay. Just to use really lay person, everyday language, that's what really it distills down to. So if we think about, if we think about um, our insecurities, whether they be spiritual or otherwise, just in terms of our sense of self-confidence and how strong or how strong is it at any particular time or how low is our self-confidence in any particular moment in life, the, the, the issue with spirituality comes in where, where we extrapolate that, we kind of extend that out to our spiritual views and beliefs. And we then rely on our spiritual views and beliefs to support us. And if we, which is fine, that's okay, okay? <laughs> Here's where it's not okay. When we start using them to support us as crutches because of our inner, in, inner, inner lack of self-confidence, okay? So that's where the rubber meets the road and it starts to get to be a slippery slope. That's what we need to look out for, okay? These are little teaching tips for you to help you look within yourself and how can you manage your own life a little bit better so that you can be happier. I mean, that's really what everything that I teach is all about, okay? So again, are they crutches that, that can support perhaps our inner lack of self-confidence in our own ability to manage our lives. That's really kind of what it distills down to. And then what's the result of that? We've all seen this happen, and maybe some of you have been through this in your own lives. You know, that the result is that we then believe in powers that are outside of ourselves. Powers like what? Well, drugs, alcohol, well, you may not think of those as powers, but you're giving your power away to a drug. Alcohol is a drug. <laughs> it is a drug. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a regulated drug by the Food and Alcohol uh, Administration and whatever they call it, the Food Food Alcohol and Tobacco Administration, whatever in the United States of America. Anyway, you know it is a drug, and there are other drugs that people can rely on. These are powers outside of ourselves. Um, shopping. <laughs> I'm just picking some very nitty gritty layperson examples. Shopping for some people is is a uh, is a belief in a power outside of themselves that's going to make them feel better, right? Going to make them feel more self confident. Oh, if I have more clothes, if I have more cars, I, you know, I get a new car, I get a bigger car, I get a faster car, a louder car in some neighborhoods, like. Uh, <laughs> some of the kids in my neighborhood, louder car, you know, uh, but also from a spiritual standpoint, gurus, gurus, mediums, folks who are outside of ourselves, we believe in their powers because why <clears throat> we are looking for self uh, for some. <clears throat> something to shore up our self-confidence inside sometimes. I'm not saying all the time. I'm not saying every time you go to a medium, it's because you don't have self-confidence in yourself. No, I'm not saying that. You can go to a medium. I've been to mediums before. You know, it's like, okay, fine. You know, I'm not saying it's a negative thing. I'm saying that red flag, look out, 
are you going for this reason that I am postulating, that I'm posing to us here? Is it due to some inner lack that we are feeling about our own abilities to manage our own lives? And if so, then understand that you are making a choice to go external to yourself to explore how to confirm and ensure that up, okay? I'm not saying that even is a bad thing to pursue, but understand consciously why you are doing what you are doing, okay? Because here's the, here's the, here's the thing. It creates a vulnerability in us. What do I mean by that? We become vulnerable or susceptible, um, prone to being used by other people who may not have <laughs> as kind and gentle and altruistic motives towards us as we may like. All right? So, this kind of displacement <clears throat> needs to be done in a very conscious way. Otherwise, you could be vulnerable unwittingly, okay? Unwittingly meaning what? Not consciously aware of being abused, either financially by somebody who's charging four, five, six hundred bucks, a thousand dollars for. Um, <laughs> you know, a reading, a psychic reading, or a true story, true story. Um, I heard about one of my clients uh, who had a fear of very, who ha had a very, very deep fear of death. And uh, I heard through the grapevine, we'll just say, I didn't hear directly from her, that she had previously um, gone to a gypsy in New York City who asked, who demanded, <laughs> who said, if you want my help, you got to pay me $80,000. We're talking $80,000 for one visit, okay? $80,000. I'm not exaggerating the number here. $80,000. And this woman collected all her jewelry that her I guess, previously wealthy husband had bought for her and brought all the jewelry down to this gypsy in New York City. I've heard since then that the FBI is after many such people in the United States and they travel around and they stay at relatives' houses and so forth. So if you are anywhere in the world and if you heard this MO, this MO stands for modus operandi in Latin, this MO, this, this style of... Uh, we'll call it business functioning, it's a big red flag, okay? But look at the spiritual insecurity of this person who brought, this woman who brought $80,000 worth of her jewelry to these people for what? Not even for a psychic reading um, in person. It was bring me these $80,000 cash, had to be cash. She gave them the jewelry, so they accepted the jewelry, of course. Um, but it was for candles. It was for sacred candles that these gypsies were going to light. And, and they told her that each candle would cost, I think it was $2,000 $2, or $4,000 for each candle. And so they got to do the math, whatever the math is. They, they, they had to light this many candles in order for, for you to get over your fears. And we will light these candles for you. Did this person even see the candles? No. How do you know they even bought candles? They don't. They just take your money. So, but this is an extreme example of spiritual insecurity, an extreme, extreme example of vulnerability, which is what I'm talking about, and abuse by cruel, cruel, narcissistic people cloaked in spiritual garb, right? So be aware of this. Don't be don't fall prey to this. Um, and there are many cults out there, many organized uh, groups. Some will call themselves religious groups and even some uh, religious, organized religions that we know that are, you know, some of the major organized religions have, 
had problems with some of their members, of course, right? You just read the daily news, right? You guys know about some of the scandals that have gone on. Well, what is that? That's because people going to that person or that organization or that cult or whatever who are spiritually insecure. They're insecure fundamentally, and then they ex then they then they they um um they extrapolate that out and they say, okay, I need spiritual help, and that's going to make me more secure. Well, not necessarily. Okay. So spiritual insecurity, vulnerability opens us up more to being um, taken advantage of in a nutshell. Okay. Um, this idea that you hear people use of this, it was meant to be, or destiny or predestination. Um, you know, people are looking for control over the universe and their lives because people feel they don't have enough control. And very often when people are very insecure or um, highly anxious, puts high anxiety puts us into a state of feeling insecure. So I'm not, I'm not using this phrase, please understand. I'm not using this phrase insecure as, oh, you're a weak person, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, we have all, I've said at the beginning, we've all, me, everybody, we've all had moments and we can, we've, <laughs> Uh, likelihood is it will all have moments as we continue going on through life of feeling somewhat insecure at times. The issue is how do we handle it? Okay, that's where the rubber meets the road. And I'm just pointing out some issues here to help you navigate life as you go forward through your lifetimes, um, you know, this life especially. Um, so again, people are looking for control. So they artificially create beliefs that exert that control they think that's going to exert that control, but are those beliefs fact-based and based on reality? That's the issue. So think about that gypsy example with the candles that the woman never even saw and she paid $80,000 for. How much of her belief in these gypsies doing this this, 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 this ceremony or whatever you want to call it for this woman for $80,000, how much of that was based in, in reality, really? Not much, I think you could agree, right? But the underlying issue is that no one can clear, clearly, no one, no one can control everything in the universe. That's really the underlying issue here. And so reliance on mediums, guides, angels, gurus, drugs and alcohol is just really misplaced, okay? We need to rely on ourselves, okay? This is a theme throughout all of my classes. We need to turn within. We need to strengthen ourselves. We need to find a way. Now, I help people do that, but you don't have to just take my classes. Find some classes <laughs> that help you really strengthen yourself within in a way that's not just content-oriented, that's not just changing your thought pattern or whatever, because changing our thought pattern will change back to what we were before in our insecure mode if we don't fundamentally change ourselves. And we'll talk about what I mean by that, um, you know, later in our discussion today. But I just want to issue spot some stuff here to open it up for questions in a few minutes. Okay. What about the meaning of life? What about this idea, the meaning of life? Um, what is our life purpose? You know, th those ideas go hand in hand. Um, what's the meaning of my life? What's my life purpose? You hear people say this all the time, frequently, okay? Where and when did this idea come from? Another word that you may hear used in some circles uh, is the idea of dharma. Dharma means duty in Sanskrit. So this idea of life purpose probably has been you know, bubbling up throughout many cultures over the millennia around the world, okay? But I know about one in particular, not because I've been part of this culture, but because I have communications with people who currently, who uh, 10,000 years ago are the progenitors of this. So I'm not saying they're the only ones who 
you know, talk about this idea of the meaning of life and life purpose and so forth. But these people, uh, and they were in human form, so these people in what we now refer to as India, 10,000 years ago, there were no countries, but that part of the world in the Himalayas, they came up with this idea called Dharma. So again, in this ancient language of Sanskrit, the word is Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A. And it just simply means duty. But why did they come up with it? They came up with it, according to uh, our discussions with them. Uh, those of you who've seen the 30th November talk, there's a brief mention and talk about this. George talks about this briefly. Um, but <clears throat> we've all had, there are a number of us have had communications with it, as many of us, and many of, um, I'm not the only one, George isn't the only one for communications with these folks that I briefly mentioned alluded to a second ago. Um, there are many dozens of people and, and uh, who I don't know, but who have communicated with me, who have had similar communications with, this, with these folks. Um, and they came up with this idea because they saw that humans were lazy. <laughs> That's what they say. They're just the human laziness factor. People, you know, this is 10,000 years ago, okay? Um, looking, at hum looking at planet Earth, looking at around planet Earth, and people pretty much involved in not too many activities other than eating, sleeping, killing each other, and procreating. That was pretty much it in a nutshell. And so they said, well, how can we get these humans moving along a little bit here and thinking about something other than those three or four or five things. Something that may help them you know, develop a civilization, some sort of culture, some sort of thinking. And they came up with this idea of dharma, duty. The idea of you should have a role in life. You should have a job. <laughs> what we now know as jobs. Little did they know at the time, they didn't know about money and greed. Little did they know that just uh, planting a little idea about greed and money would have gotten people really moving really fast. But instead, they came up with this idea of Dharma. They're, they're like way too high thinking. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know, sometimes people are like, they think too high. That's why I try to bring things down to layperson language, you know, without all this airy fairy talk. No. We could bring it down to layperson's language if you really understand the principles. Well, they were just, you know, they were experimenting, okay? So they said, okay, you're going to go down there. You, so-and-so, are going to go down there, and you're going to be so-and-so down there on planet Earth this next lifetime, and you're going to plant seeds. You're going to be a teacher, and you're going to plant seeds about this idea of Dharma and stuff, and then, boom, it starts spreading out, right? And again, this may have happened in other parts of the world, too, at the time. I'm not aware of that, uh, <clears throat> but but it, it it probably did. But the one I'm aware of is like sprouted, sprouted, the seeds sprouted in the Himalayas and spread out from there. <clears throat> what has it developed into today, now 10,000 years later? It's all this guilt. It's all this, it developed over there in India, those of you who know anything about India, into this caste system caste system, C-A-S-T-E, if you want to look that up in, uh, online. The caste system, it's horrific. You got the untouchables down here, you got the Brahmins up here, and you got a whole bunch of levels in between that I don't even, I don't care to know much about. I just know that it's a mess. And it's just all of these levels. Levels have developed. And then it's not just levels on this side, but there's tons of levels on the other side. We'll talk about that in our next uh, meet the author series in, in October. We're going to talk about levels on the other side and all this other stuff. But the caste system, and it became a way for people to abuse other people. Stepping on other, oh, you're a lower caste. You're a lower level that you can't come into this store. You can't come into this temple. You can't marry with this other person. You can't even associate with the other people. You have to be in this section of the city. All of that kind of stuff. 
that still exists today. You don't see it on the international news because it is not a pretty scene and it's not good for tourism. This is not good for foreign policy. You will not see India touting the fact that they have a caste system. <laughs> they're, not, they're, not, they're not bragging about it, all right? But it exists. It's deeply embedded in the culture. Even where they're saying they're trying to get rid of it, it's so embedded in the culture for 10,000 years. Are you kidding? Trying to get something out of the culture for 10, that's been there for 10,000 years? Look at the United States. We've only existed as the United States of America for what, 250 years or whatever the math is. You know, not that long. And look at how, 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 how much of the stuff that's embedded in our culture is, 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 is really difficult to get out after 250 years, 10,000 years. Are you kidding? Anyway, so, you know, this was an unintended consequence. This was not, not, not uh, seen, not predicted, not... <laughs> It wasn't the intention, for sure, of this group of spiritual leaders who came up with this idea of Dharma, but it's been conflated and confused and added to, and you've seen this in every other culture in the world, this has happened over time. And you've seen it in religions, you've seen it in cultures where stuff gets added, people trying to control other people, and these institutions are a really efficient way why are they so efficient? Because you have a ready-made market. <laughs> it's like the market has already been created for you. It's a collection of people who have a, uh, a uh, common belief system. Well, you just insert yourself in there, and then you start, <laughs> it's like sticking stuff into the ventilation system in a building where people are trapped in the building already. And they're they're, they're self-trapped. In other words, they've chosen to be part of that institution. But you just start piping stuff through the ventilation systems. They start breathing it and believing it. Okay. So, but you know that. So, but but see now that this group who came up with this idea of Dharma ten thousand years ago, <clears throat> now they're realizing the following principles and teaching points that I want to share with you guys. And again, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this so you can apply this in your own life. This is this is this is this is stuff I'm I'm a I'm a teach the people kind of guy. You know, I, I want to share this information with everybody down here at ground level. You know, these ideas that these are these, you know, these people up in the ivory towers come up with, so to speak, just figuratively speaking, you know. Um, you know, these are, these are, these should be shared with as many people as possible, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, but, you know, it, it, it's born out of what? This idea of Dharma and what's the meaning of life and what's my life purpose? It's born out of the students insecure, you know, the teacher's concern about the student's insecurity. So like we talked about it earlier, that insecurity. So the teacher looks and says, oh, I feel sorry for the student. I want to help the student. So it comes from a good place, usually. You know, let's assume best case scenario. Let's think of the, the person in the best light, the, the teacher. And the teacher thinks, oh, but I want to help the student. And I want to relieve that insecurity. And so maybe if I give them certainty, that will help relieve their insecurity. Even if the teacher knows that certainty is, doesn't exist in the universe, they do that. Now, it, now what does it do? It, it, it keeps the, it, it, of course, it immediately relieves the student of their, their concerns, their fears, but it's temporary. That's the problem with it. But it also another problem. So there are ancillary problems that are very much more significant than even the, than the, than the lack of, than the immediacy and the lack of permanence of the solution and that's that it keeps the seeker motivated along the path and locked into that teacher it keeps the teacher dependent i mean no the student dependent on the teacher and those of you who have taken my classes you heard me say i'm the opposite guy i want to make you independent i want to teach you guys how to think differently and filter from different perspectives so now I'm always here to help you and you can always reach out to me and 
Don't be that person who thinks, oh, Kelvin's too busy. He doesn't have time for my question. No, that's what I'm here for. Ask me the questions. But my objective is to help you be a free thinker on your own, not be reliant on a, 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 you know, a guru or an angel or a medium or a spirit guide or any of those, all right? Because you displace your power to them, all right? makes you locked into them, whoever the them is. But in the guru example, and again, you can plug in any of those others into this guru blank, fill in the blank. It serves the guru's self-interest by, by getting and keeping the seeker, we'll call the student a seeker, a seeker of knowledge, okay? They have very, very good intentions, but it keeps the seeker locked in to the guru, and that meets the guru's self-interest, but does it serve the student's self-interest? Your self-interest as a student, you need to ask yourself that question all the time. Teaching point, teaching point, okay? All right, what's the solution instead? The solution is being comfortable with the unknown. That's what gets rid of our, our fear, our concern, of uncertainty, because uncertainty exists in the universe. That's what I help people do. Get, un get comfortable with the unknown. Where does that start? <laughs> you know, we get comfortable with the whole universe and the universe and the unknown of the universe. Starts with ourselves. <laughs> Getting comfortable within ourselves first. As we get more comfortable within ourselves, we get more comfortable with our spouse, our friends, the unknown stuff that they may do. And we get more comfortable as it extends out eventually with everything in the universe, okay? That may come at us in an unknown, unpredicted, uh, is that a word? Uh, <laughs> unpredictable way, <laughs> all right? But it starts within ourselves, turning within, getting comfortable with ourselves. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where people tend not to go, all right? Now, a couple of key points that may be percolating in your mind that may be sources of confusion about this idea of, wait, wait, wait a minute, no life purpose? What about this idea of soul plans? Do soul plans exist? Yes, they do. So this, they are a source of confusion about this idea of this, what I'm saying, what I'm teaching is there is no meaning of life. There is no one meaning of life. There are many meanings. I have many meanings of my life. You know, there's not one meaning of life. All right. I don't have one life purpose. I have many life purposes and I have chosen different life purposes at different times in my life, depending on situation. My, I'll give you myself my example. We come back to this source of this, this soul planet issue in a second. But just quick aside, I have had many life purposes. For example, when I was teaching meditation full time in the 1970s, and you guys know I still teach it now, it's been 48 years. But most of the time I taught on the side. For the first 10 years, I taught full time. I taught a thousand people to meditate. And now I've been teaching for about the last, you know, eight, eight, nine years full time again. And, you know, another what thousand people but in between i taught you know a bunch of thousands of people but little by little over those most of those you know like the whatever the math is 35 years or something i still taught but i did it on the side why because my life purpose then became taking care of my family that became my life purpose at that point in my life once i started raising my fam a family in my Mid 30s, when I was in my mid 30s, this lifetime we're talking about, okay? Um, and I had two children to raise. Well, I couldn't do that purely on teaching meditation, okay? So I got other jobs, corporate jobs. You know, you guys know my, many of you know my history. You can just look me up on LinkedIn. Just look at all my corporate. You're like, how many careers did this guy, Kelvin Shin, have this lifetime? <laughs> look at my LinkedIn, all right? So my point is, my life purpose was that then, raising my family, taking care of my family. I changed my focus from teaching meditation to doing corporate stuff, and I went to law school, et cetera, et cetera, okay? 
my life purpose has changed again, you could say, and I'm focusing on teaching my meditation classes, teaching these classes, teaching people how to live their life more through in a more virtuous way. What do I mean by virtuous? What I mean by virtuous is not what most people mean in 21st century earth. What I mean by virtuous is turning within, getting more comfortable with ourselves, knowing thyself. So I use virtue in the Greek sense, in the ancient Greek sense of the of the of the of the idea of virtue, not the 21st century of do this, don't do that, follow these rules. That's how most people think of virtue. No, no, I, I use it in a different way. But that's what my teaching is about. All right, helping people live life more fully now in the continual present. That's my life purpose. Now more fully, life purpose in my um, I say fully in my full time job, which is doing what I do now through my nonprofits. But have I done that through my other corporate jobs too? Yes, I was always in a helping mode. It's just more focused now. So you could arguably say Kelvin's life purpose is to help people this life. Okay, fine. Yeah, great. I, I, I'll, I, I'll buy that. But you see how it's been channeled in different avenues at different ways at different points in my life, okay? I think that's a, a healthier way to look at this idea of life purpose. Because again, back to this idea of soul plans, can we come into, can, before we are born, can we come up with a life purpose for, that we want to have for this life? Yes, we can do that. We can do that. And can it get derailed? You know what derailed means? Can it go off the rails after you get born? Yes. Why? Because you forget, <laughs> you make different choices, uh, or you remember what your life, uh, what you wanted your life to be about. That's what people call life purpose. I want to do this in my life. My my life, you know, I, I, I the life purpose. I don't like the. I, you know, I like plan. I like. I don't like the word contract. Soul contract so much because plans can change, and purpose sounds so written in stone, and we know that it's not. It's it's not written in stone. You can forget. You can make other choices, or here's the thing that most people forget, is that other people can make choices that affect you and your soul plan, your choice before choices that you made before you came in uh, into that into that lifetime, into that body, in, incarnated, were born. Okay, other people can make choices your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your father's boss, your mother's boss, your father's boss's boss's boss, your mother's boss's boss's boss can make decisions that affect not just your mother and your father, but they affect you. So people forget, people are so misunderstanding of these principles. There are fundamental misunderstandings, and I'm pointing out some of the key ones to you right now. People, and it, what does it stem from? Spiritual insecurity. It really stems from that. Because when you come from a place of being insecure, you, are, you feel more secure when you are made the center of the universe. Think about that concept I just said. When you are feeling insecure, you are made to feel more and more secure, more secure when you are made to feel the center of the universe. And what do many teachers, especially spiritual teachers and religious leaders and organize and religions and so forth, what do they do? They make you the center of the universe. You think about that. Think about that one statement and filter what you know about spiritual teachers or guides from the other side or angels who come through the medium to talk to you, whatever. How are they, are, are they saying things? Ask yourself, are they saying, or just on this side, religions, spiritual leaders, religious leaders, are they saying things in that scripture that seem to make me very important and the, as if I'm the center of the universe, okay? That's a red flag because you're not the center of the universe. You are the center of your universe. Yes, that's my essays in this, my book here, my book about self-interest. Yes, of course, we are the center of our own universe, but are we the center of the universe, universe? No, 
there's all these other minds making decisions and so forth. They're the center of their own universe. We are a universe of many, 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 it's trillions is too small a number, you know, but we'll just use trillions because it's big enough number for probably most of you to get your mind around. You can't even get your mind around trillion. What's a trillion, you know? So I think a trillion is a million million, right? So it's like, what does that mean? But there's a trillion other minds who have a trillion universes that they are the center of the universe of. The universe is made up of trillions and trillions of other universes, meaning minds, that think they're the center of the universe. And they are the center of their universe. That, I think, is accurate. And we should be self-interested and looking out for ourselves. Not to an extreme extent, because if you read that essay in my book, that's selfishness. And we talked about that in our uh, earlier talk, find it on YouTube, on uh, love and unconditional love. We talked about this idea of being selfish. Um, but my point is that be aware, beware, be aware, that's where beware comes from, beware of those beings, whether they in physical form here on earth or not physical form on the other side, who, who teach you to think of yourself as the center of the universe, or they make you not, not even teach you. This is even more subtle than that. It's they make you feel like you are the center of the universe. Okay. Because feeling em emotions is a very, very subtle and slippery way to influence you. That's what sales is all about. Those of you who've ever been in sales before, I sold life insurance before I went to law school. And one of the key sales, this is sales 101. Any sales training you've ever taken for any, selling anything, doesn't matter, sell software, sell medical supplies, sell life insurance like I did, sell cars, sell whatever. Sales 101 is emotion sells, intellect tells. Emotion sells, intellect tells. That's a phrase that's been used in sales trainings for, I don't know, I think since the 1920s and 1930s, somebody wrote it in a book. I can't remember the guy's name. But anyway, emotion sells, intellect tells. So anybody who is very emotional with you in terms of making you feel this way and feel that way, it's be careful because they're selling you. They're, you're vulnerable. Not just you, me, everybody, we all are. That's what they do on television. All the ads, they're emotional. They're, 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 you look, watch them from this lens now. You'll see the emotion in the ads. It's not just about, well, this thing is going to help you this way and this way and this way and this way. I tend to take a different approach. I get passionate about what I'm teaching, but I want to give you filters and principles to look through. So some of you, you know, for some people, what I, the way I teach is very boring. It doesn't, it's not this inspirational, oh, I walk away, I felt so amazing, walked out of the ballroom and blah, blah, blah. Red flag, okay? You are vulnerable to whoever is making you feel that way, all right? I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying watch out, that's all, okay? Because they may, could, may be able to do that and be very loving and giving and kind and give you valuable information. That's ideal, okay? That's the ideal mix, but be careful, okay? That's all. Um, so can we make plans? Yes, we can make plans, but they're change, changeable, just like I said, okay? You've connected the dots hopefully by now. Free will affects those plans that we can come in with, with a, a purpose in our life. Not just our free will. The trillions of other minds making their free, will, their free will choices. So there's no one life purpose. That's the summary on this point. We make choices and others make choices that affect us. All right, let's touch on this idea of perfection and then we'll close it up and open up for questions in a minute. Perfection. What about this idea of perfection? This idea of enlightenment. You've heard that term. I'm going to read some passages from my book here. 
Okay, and um, those of you who have the book, you can read along with me. I'm on uh, page 260, 260 on my book. Um, what about this idea of perfection? This is the idea, uh, the essay is, starts on page 259 and it's called Unbundling Enlightenment. Unbundling this idea of enlightenment, you know. First of all, let me just say one thing. I talk about this on page 259, but let me just say one thing. If you're using the word enlightened or enlightenment in a very loosey-goosey kind of way, what do I mean by that? Like, oh, very enlightened. It's like somebody who's very self-aware. That's okay. I'm okay with that. But that's not the technical definition of enlightenment, which I'll tell you in a second. Okay, so if you're using it very loosey-goosey that way, you know, oh, uh, you know, we should know ourselves better. We should be more enlightened that way. That's fine, okay? But that's not how we're you. I'm using the word enlightenment. I'm using it in the way that gurus and spiritual teachers use the word enlightenment. And they use the word enlightenment as a, a description of a state of perfection. You are now perfect. You are in a state of perfection. That's what they say, they, they mean when they say enlightened, okay? Another phrase, acting in accordance with the laws of nature. That's a phrase that's commonly used. All your actions will be spontaneously right. You cannot make a mistake if you are enlightened, all right? That's the thinking, all right? Right action. You cannot make a mistake. But what does enlightenment also mean then? If you can never make a mistake, you can never grow anymore. That's what that means. So in that sense, and they really do mean that, that you've grown as far as you can grow because you are perfect. How can you grow anymore from being perfect? That's what perfect means. <laughs> there is no like more perfect. There's no such thing as more perfect. Just like this one drives me nuts. I hear sports analysts say this all the time because they, they don't understand English. They, they understand sports. They're just, you know, they're on there because they're popular to talk about sports. More unique. More, there is no such thing as more unique. That's, that's, like, that's, that's like saying the bestest. That's the bestest thing. Have you ever heard anybody say bestest? There's no such thing as bestest. The most best. There's no such thing. Best means best nothing better <laughs> unique means unique nothing more unique than that that's what unique means perfection that's it okay you can't improve yourself so but here's the thing so they will they, they would agree with you know these uh, these spiritual teachers who use the phrase enlightenment or uh, be, keep in mind i'm talking about angels on the other side spirit guides they're they're using this phrase too, a lot. It's a misuse of the phrase, okay? There's no such thing as perfection. Perfection means, think about it. Perfection means no more growth. No more growth means static, no change, okay? No change means what? No change means you've merged with something. You've merged with some cosmic soup, I call it. Some people call it God, the universe, the source, the light, the absolute. People use different phrases. I say merge with cosmic soup. That's what people think. But the reality is our individuality continues. Something about us continues. I talk about this in greater detail in my Afterlife series classes. but. You know, in session six, we'll get into that. Those of you who are taking that class, we haven't talked about it yet. Session six, I'll get into that in much greater detail. What continues? But in a nutshell, our individuality continues. When you talk to a medium, are you talking to cosmic soup on the other side? No, you're talking to an angel, your dead loved one. You're talking to Jesus. You're talking to somebody's coming through the medium, okay? There's an individual, Mohammed, Buddha, pick one, okay? There's an individual that's continuing to exist, hasn't merged into some cosmic soup. 
there is no perfection. There is no state of perfection, okay? Um, you've plateaued out is a phrase that I use somewhere in, in, on page 260, I guess. We've plateaued out, um, but there's no need for improvement. And it's very appealing to the seeker who is insecure. You see how these are all tying together, these three concepts that we talk about in the title of this talk. The seeker who is insecure seeks perfection because they think that Finally, finally, everything will be fine. Everything will be good. All right? What I'm teaching is that everything can be content, maybe not absolutely perfect, but you can be content. To me, that's the state that I would call a state of perfection, <laughs> but not in the way that most spiritual teachers talk about perfection, a state of contentment, inner peace, all right? Not a state of literal perfection where you cannot make a mistake ever. That's the way most spiritual teachers, including angels on the other side, use this idea of enlightenment and perfection. And they may or may not say that to you, but that's what they mean, because they have believed this. They've they themselves are insecure, these angels and so forth, who are teaching this way. So they have bought into this whole belief system, and therefore they think, again, because to help you with your insecurity, to make you feel more secure, they'll give you this, this perspective, which I'm saying is actually not correct, and worse than not correct, can lead to suffering. So, because what does it do? On uh, It puts us in a place where we are beyond the imagination horizon. I use this idea on page 260 in the book. Beyond the imagination horizon, we are not in the present. We're always trying to live so that we can be enlightened. We do everything so that we can be enlightened instead of spending time with your family. I know people in this you know, the organization that I used to be involved with in the 1970s, people who have literally, not even figuratively, some people have just figuratively emotionally divorced themselves from their families. Some have literally divorced themselves from their families to seek enlightenment. No, this is about living our lives now in the continual present. That's what life is and should be about. This notion of enlightenment is, a con is, is in conf conflict. So if you have any spiritual teachers out there, you've read, you've seen on YouTube, been to a workshops where they talk about enlightenment and living in the present, they are, they are teaching cognitively dissonantly. Their, their teachings are not consistent. So they're living beyond the imagination horizon. <laughs> they're teaching you to be beyond the imagination horizon. Oh, enlightenment, 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 be in the present. You can't, you can't, the, the two don't go together, all right? This idea of perfection and being in the present when you're not in state of perfection in the present, because nobody is, okay? That's not living in the present. That's living in what we call the future, or I refer to as beyond the imagination horizon, okay? That's what we call the future in layperson language, okay? but it leads to suffering, which I talk about on page 261 here, because living in the non-present also has a serious unintended consequence. It leads to continual suffering. The individual constantly is unhappy with their present situation, their present condition in life. They always seek something that is beyond their grasp, and this ensures an unhappy life. All right. Questions. We want to have a happy life. So all of these principles that I talked about today, just to sum up, is to help us promote being, being happier and living our life and enjoying our life more in the continual present that we're always in any way 
You don't have to try to be in the continual present. We are always in the continual present, physically and mentally. Emotionally, however, our feelings, in other words, very often propel us out of the present. Into That's why I call it imagination. Beyond our imagination horizon. That's why I call it imagination, because it's not actual. We're always in the continual present, actually. But our imagination sometimes takes us out of it. Okay? And that's where suffering, that's where suffering resides. So I am the anti-suffering guy. I am the inner contentment, happiness, if you want to define happiness that way. I think of it more as inner contentment. We're at peace within ourselves with whatever is going on. Okay? So I hope that helps. Let's open up the questions. Please open up, open up, open up. Questions, questions, questions. Anybody? Um, feel free. I'm going to take myself off of... Uh, I'm going to go gallery here so I can see you guys. Here we go. Questions. Please open up questions. Yes. Shannon, is that you? No? Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you. I really enjoyed what you talked about today. I don't have a question, but I liked it. Oh, good. Good. Thank you for the feedback. Calvin? Yes. Is that Barbara? Um, yes. Yes, it Barbara, was, uh, yeah. There was a, a, a one stage um, that somebody asked me about the meaning of life. Uh -huh. And I said, look, um, I can only answer from the way I see it. For me, the meaning of life for me is to be happy. So if I know myself and I know what makes me happy and I can pursue the things that make me happy, then... To me, that is the big overall purpose of my life, the umbrella. But I love the way that you, uh, you know, broke it down um, in, in different uh, uh, parts of, you know, purposes that you have in different stages of your life. And while you were talking, I was actually making a list. And um, the one purpose that I wrote down at the top <laughs> was grow up. And um, when I wrote it down, I realized um, how important it was for me at some stage to grow up emotionally. Mm. So no, I, that, that was a, a, one of the purposes that, that I had. And um, it's just wonderful when I, when I wrote down now what would be the purpose um, of my life now at this stage of my life where my daughter has grown up and you know, I've, I've accomplished, uh, uh, you know, I can, I've accomplished a few things in my life. How do I see this, this last uh, big stretch, you know, where I want to finish strong? And I wrote down here that um, it, it's my purpose in life now to get others to live with deeper meaning and be happier, because I know how, what it means to me to be happy. So then I can can guide others and say, let's all be happier together. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Barbara. That's great. That, that, exactly. So you, you've probably seen, those of you who have my book, I, I talk about what I think in terms of the meaning of life or how, how to view life. And I, and I view it similarly to you. You know, it, it, life is about being happy and content and figuring things out. And, and that's the way I view life. How other people view life may be very different from me. And it's not my job. It's not my, not, never mind my job, never my responsibility. And it's not my right. It's, I don't have a right to determine what, how other people uh, view their lives and how they want to live their lives and, and how they interpret their lives. That's each, up to each of us. And I, it took me a while, I, and, I, and I've said this to my good friend Sean here, <laughs> the, I think yesterday, did I say this to you, the day before yesterday, Sean? I said, you know, I gave up, uh, and to your, use your word, Barbara, I grew up, I grew up, and I, um, I got over my Messiah complex, I called it, <laughs> jokingly, but seriously, called my Messiah complex, which is, you know, save the world, help, you know, save other people. You can't save anybody. 
I help people, many of you are my students, obviously, all of you are my students on here right now. <laughs> you know, um, you know, you're, you're all, you're all uh, uh, my students right now, obviously. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, my job, my role, the way I look at it is to help you think, not to get you to follow me or even to believe what I believe. I've come to my beliefs based on, you guys know, thinking about these things and testing them. Quite frankly, I've tested out my own theories and principles and so forth many times over the millennia. So, um, you know, but, but you have to do that yourself. Yes, I can inspire you hopefully to do that on your own, and maybe my examples will help give you some data points and way to filter and to look at different things. Maybe, maybe my perspectives can do that, but it's not to get you to believe what I believe. It's to get you to think in a way that's uh, your way, your way that's gonna work for you. Sharon, great to see you. Um, thank you for joining. Um, and so uh, this is, you know, contentment, inner peace. To me, that's the meaning of life. And we take other different aspects and avenues, as I exampled earlier, um, at different points in our lives. Think about it this way also. Let's say you are on the other side and you are creating a soul plan for yourself. How simplistic would you be to think that I'm going to go down and I'm going to be president of the United States. Okay, whatever. Okay, you could you have that thought? <laughs> Maybe somebody did have that thought. <laughs> Maybe they did become president of the United States. Probably 99% of the people who had that thought did not become president of the United States. So, but, but the thing is, could you have that thought? Yes. Would it be, uh, what, what kind of person would have that as the only thought that they could have out of the millions of thoughts and the millions of things that you could that you could craft and create as part of your soul plan on the other side, why would you just pick one or two things? Why wouldn't you have a, a, a kind of a, a tapestry? Think about it that way. A tapestry, a beautiful painting of your of what you would like your life to look like that's not just throw the blue color on the on the paint on, on the on, on, on the uh, canvas you know I'm gonna be blue this lifetime well why why, why, why do you just be blue this lifetime why, why don't you just be you could be blue with some teal and some beige and some this and that wouldn't you do that what kind of mind would be so simplistic is my point you know and yet so if you think about it that way and yet, so many mediums, so many people, so many angels on the other side are telling human beings through their, through their sessions, you had one purpose, you have one purpose, and this is your, okay, maybe, maybe you are that one person who just thought, I want to be president of the United States, and I want to be blue, okay, or I want to be red, I want to be purple, I want to be green. I want to be, you know, whatever, one color person. <laughs> but that, that's, that, that's not a very complex mind to me, <laughs> right? That's just all I'm saying. So very good. Thank you so much for sharing that, Barbara. Anybody else? I want to make another comment on something that Barbara said. Anybody? Other questions or comments before I make another comment on my own? Sean, anybody? Christina, no? Michaela, great to see you. John. Um, oh, very good. Good, good? Great. So uh, another comment, and it's not a direct comment. It's kind of an oblique or a side comment on something that Barbara reminded me of. And she said that she wants to help other people, <clears throat> which is what I do. It's a great thing to do, to help other people. But here's the thing, and I just, um, it's a little suggestion what's a strong suggestion i actually wrote an essay on this point which i'm not going to get into in great detail with you right now i'm going to publish this essay 
sometime in the next 24 to 48 hours on my website. And um, you go to kelvinchen.org and go to the blog page on kelvinchen.org. And this is where I'm going to post this one. But uh, the title of it, <clears throat> the title of the essay is A Huge Source of Suffering Equals Helping People Who Don't Want to Be Helped. I don't know if you can read that on your screen. Helping people who don't want to be helped. That's a huge source of suffering. And it's part of the big, part of one of the big messages. There are many messages in the 30th November talk, but it's one of the large big messages of the 30th November talk that was shared in 2014, as you guys may know, in um, Alexandria, Virginia, the event that I organized. You can, if you don't know about that, you can go watch it at 30thnovember.com. 30th November. You got to put the TH after the 30. So 30th November.com. <clears throat> but let me just read you one paragraph. And I kind of alluded to this, but I didn't weave it in with this idea of helping people who don't want to be helped, as I do here in this essay. I, I, I alluded to this, prince, this, this point, this principle, or this point, earlier in our talk to, today together, the beginning. But let me just read you this one paragraph. Um, the 30th November message that was shared in 2014, it was a marker in the spiritual history of humankind to make clear that Key spiritual leaders involved in the world and planet Earth for the past 10,000 years had decided that they too, they too, they also recognized that overhelping causes suffering, overhelping, that by demanding obedience from their followers, they inadvertently caused those devout followers to be more susceptible to being bullied by others, others who didn't have the kind motives that these spiritual leaders had. These spiritual leaders, meaning the ones from 10, that over the last 10,000 years that um, were helping, have been helping humankind. In effect, by demanding spiritual obedience, these leaders had unwittingly trained their followers to become more compliant, more passive, and unfortunately, more vulnerable to being taken advantage of by selfish and narcissistic people in the world. Ironically, the more devout the follower, the more obedient they were, yet the more vulnerable they became to mistreatment by others. So that's just a, a few short paragraphs from this longer essay. But think about that. Think about that how devout following i was thinking I, I didn't put this i didn't put this point in the essay um but i'll share it with you now think about this point how devout following whether through spiritual uh groups or organized what we know as organized religions in the judeo christian islamic religions how devout following actually promotes authoritarian thought. It promotes authoritarian belief and therefore following authoritarian leaders, totalitarian leaders. It's intimately connected. That's a fundamental reason. They didn't talk about this in the 30th November talk. I've extrapolated this and extracted this, <clears throat> extracted that, that idea, and then extrapolated it to our current 21st century political climate. But it is directly, it's a direct cause. It's a direct cause of promoting totalitarianism on planet Earth is demanding devout following on a spiritual level, whether it's an angel saying this to you, whether it's um, a political leader, whether it's somebody at your neighborhood church, that is that 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 devotion promotes subservience 
subservience promotes blind following, blind following promotes totalitarianism. Instead, as you may have heard, if you've seen or watched the 30th November talk, that the, the idea instead that they are encouraging, not say blindly follow us, these spiritual leaders on the other side, the encouragement is to begin to view life more as an eternal democracy. That's a whole other talk we can have another time. But anyway, thank you, Barbara, for sharing that, your, your thoughts, and for helping stir that for those thoughts up in me to share with all of you on this in this session. Anything else? Any other comments, questions? Any questions on what I just said? <laughs> Calvin? Yes. Hi, it's Sharon. Oh, Sharon, great. Great to see you. Hi. I'm coming in late here. So if this was already spoken about, you know, sure. please forgive me. Yeah. But I was coming in when you said about, you know, the helping profession and helping others. And um, you know, I, I, as you know, I'm a social worker and you know, apparently we, we're in the service profession too. But the more I'm in this profession, the more I'm seeing that. When I help myself, it is a form of helping others and how, you know, it's not selfish, you know, but actually when I fill my cup, when I work on myself more inadvertently, it also is helping others. So <laughs> just exactly. wanted to no, beautifully know your said. thoughts about that. No, it's beautifully said. And thank you for saying that. And I, I briefly touched on that earlier. You'll see when you watch the video but um, the recording, but um, it, it, it's, it's always good to have that idea reinforced. So thank you so much, Sharon, for sharing that. It's so important. It's, we have to take care of ourselves. And now I talk about turning within and connecting with ourselves and so forth, but that's one of many ways that Sharon is alluding to, to take care of ourselves. We need to eat good food. We need to hang out with good, you know, supportive people who are not banging on us and criticizing us. That's all taking care of ourselves, exercising, you know, getting our cardiovascular going so that, I mean, we're all in physical machines here. We call it a, a body. This is a, our physical biological body. This is a machine. We need to take care of it, you know? And, 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 and even though I don't look 70 years old, uh, my body is 70 years old. And even though I've taken care of it, and a lot of it is it's still 18 years old from a from a biochemistry standpoint, some of the machinery, uh, you know, starts to wear on everybody. And so we need to take care of ourselves on many different levels, whether it's mental, physical, emotional. Sharon's an unbelievable psychotherapist, and then or uh, or, or or what we can generally refer to as the spiritual or energetic level. Uh, I like to call it all of those levels. We need to take care of ourselves. And Sharon makes an, a, a really great point. We take care of ourselves. That's really the first step in helping take care of other people. We, we, we automatically take care of other people without even them knowing that we're helping them by us helping ourselves, right? Because essentially, if you think about it this way, to the extent that I am really tired and not taking care of my Myself, I'm draining other people. Whenever I talk with them, whenever I go to the store and I'm hanging out with them, I'm just paying, uh, you know, <laughs> tapping my card now, uh, you know, at Trader Joe's, uh, buying food. I'm interacting somewhat with people. And my energy is, we are energy, right? All right what we are, we are, yes, I have a physical biological body. Okay. And I have a mind, blah, blah. But, my, but we are energy, we are energy forms, we're walking around and if our energy is depleted, then I'm draining people. I am not helping other people by draining them, <laughs> trust me. And so by filling our cup, to use Sharon's great expression, by Spir filling Spiritual our... hygiene. <laughs> yes, spiritual hygiene, I love that. Sharon's, Sharon is a, a wealth of this, kind of knowledge. So I love that, Sharon. Spiritual hygiene. We need to clean it up. You brush your teeth. How about the rest of you? <laughs> Did you brush the rest of you? That's, you know, think of meditation that way. 
All right. I, I, tell, I often tell people, you know, the brush, their, you know, think of it as brushing your teeth, but that's great, Sharon. I'm going to start using that. It's spiritual hygiene. It's like taking care of ourselves is crucial. You know, it's, 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 it's not that complicated. You know, you know, so many teachers make these things so complicated. I try to drill it down to the basics. It's really fun. There are fundamental principles. If we apply them consistently, the key word is consistent, that the consistent regularity of the spiritual hygiene that's, that Sharon's talking about, it snowballs in a really positive way. Those of you and some, some, of, some of you uh, who are watching this recording, you know, have, have anxiety issues. And some of my students have very high anxiety issues. But once you start turning the ship <laughs> in the right direction, in the di right, right meaning what? Meaning in the direction of more spiritual hygiene, in the direction of more inner strength, more self-confidence, like we talked about earlier in the session today, the beginning, more of that, it snowballs in a very positive way. It turns things around. And so, but the consistency of that spiritual hygiene, the consistency of the practice of taking care of ourselves, that keeps the snowball going. And you want to keep the snowball going. Trust me, I've been consciously this lifetime, 51 years now, um, taking, uh, walking my own talk in that respect. <laughs> okay. Great stuff. Thank you, Sharon. Really, always, uh, Sharon is a wealth of these, these kind of tidbits and very, you know, distilled down powerful thoughts. Thank you so much. Um, anything else before we call it a session? Anybody else? Good, good, good. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Next time. Um, next time, and I, as I said, just a heads up, um, next time will be in October, and um, in the email that you'll get, it has the dates, um, but the next session, I think, is October, uh, if you give me a sec, I'll just put it on the recording right now. Let's see. Um, let's see. It's um, all right. Saturday, October 9th. That's the date. Saturday, October 9th for the next session. Um, and we're going to talk about angels. We talk about levels on the other side, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll send you, uh, you know, an email on that, uh, describing a little bit more detail what we'll be talking about um, in a couple of months. Um, and again, those of you who are watching the recording, if you're not on my email list, just find me at kelvinchin.org and go to the contact page and send me your email address and I'll add you to the list. Okay, great to see everybody. Take care now. Thank you, Kelvin. Bye. You're welcome. Very welcome.